check one, two. All right. Yeah, like Ros was saying, um, yeah, so, well, I am continuing on the, the series that I began, oh, it must have been like months ago on Samson. And uh, it's been a while. And, uh, and the last message I shared on, uh, on Samson was actually on the angel of the Lord. But I'd say this, if, uh, if you need a refresher, uh, you can always, you know, check those part one and part two on uh, the New Beginnings website or uh, on YouTube. It's just under the Samson series, so I'm really stoked to, uh, to kind of continue with it. But, you know, I just felt the last couple of messages that I preached was, was, was to take a couple of detours with the last couple of messages uh, that I recently shared with you. And, uh, but now I want to bring us back to the book of Judges, and there's probably going to be a couple of more after, after this message today, too, on the Samson series. Um, So I'm just going to kind of launch into it. So like I said, if you haven't uh, seen the last two, you can just access the website, New Beginnings website and YouTube. Samson series. Okay. But you know what? I'm really excited to see what the Lord wants to say to the church this morning. And uh, yeah. So let's get my PowerPoint up. Hopefully this works too. Yes. All right. So the title of my message is Samson Series, God Behind the Man. You know, it's interesting with Ken's, uh, with with the prophetic word that uh, Ken brought this morning. You know, that God is actually, you know, sometimes when it comes to our circumstances, sometimes we don't feel God, we don't sense God's presence, and we don't, sometimes we think that, God, where are you? But, uh, you know, if we were to look back, at our lives, I think it was Paul Scanlon, he said, you would see the fingerprints of God all over our lives, that God has been behind the scenes working on our behalf and our circumstances. So I thought that was really cool. So the title of my message is God Behind the Man. So, uh, you know, Samson was a, was a pretty privileged guy. And his story is is full of a lot of irony. And uh, no other deliverer in the book of Judges matches his his insane potential. Uh, He had uh, godly parents. He had a good start in life. His birth was announced by the angel of the Lord. Uh, He was consecrated and separated for God's purpose in Israel as a Nazarite from the womb. And as a young man, he is stirred by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Yahweh, and he was empowered with extraordinary gifts and granted exceptional opportunities for heroism. The writer of the book of Judges devotes more attention to Samson than any other judge. There is four chapters dedicated to his life. But yet, despite all these advantages, the sad reality is is that Samson uh, Samson accomplishes less on behalf of his people than any of the other judges who went before him. Perhaps it is because his personal exploits are so like mind-blowing, and we see that in chapter 14, 15, and 16, some of his exploits, that so much attention has been given to this guy, given to Samson in the book of Judges. Samson is an impressive dude. I mean, he's an impressive individual. But it turns out he it turns out that he's anything but a military hero. He never leads Israel into battle. He never engages the Philistines in martial combat. He never experiences a military victory. And all his accomplishments are personal, and all of his victories are private victories. You know, because Samson, he was the one who was going to be the one who would begin to deliver Israel from the oppression of the Philistines, who at the time were the hated enemies of Israel. And this is just interesting here. Um, uh, Did you know that, that Palestine in the Middle East was a term coined by Roman Emperor Hadrian in 135 AD? I mean, this guy, he hated the Jews, and so to spite them, he pronounced as if a man could do this, but he pronounced a curse on them. And just to destroy and obliterate any connection that the Jews had to the ancient homeland, 
He called the land of Israel the land, uh, you know, which is the land of Judea or the land of Israel. He called it Palestine. And Palestine is a Latin named after the ancient enemies of Israel, the Philistines or Philistines. But now we know the history that God resurrected. And this is, this is history. This is, you know, we can go back and we can, have, we can look at this. That God resurrected the Jewish nation. So the modern state of Israel was born on May 14th, 1948, after the Jewish people, having been scattered in the diaspora, or the, they were scattered throughout the four winds of the earth, the four corners of the earth since 70 AD, fulfilling ancient biblical prophecy that God would gather his people back into the land he had promised to Abraham. So God is faithful to his word, and he's faithful to his people. So it's kind of laughable that this man thought he could curse Israel because a mere man cannot curse what God has already blessed or who God has already blessed. So when we look at Samson's life, we see that his course was pretty much laid out for him. Uh, he would be the savior of Israel. Well, he would begin to deliver Israel. He would uh, destroy Israel's enemies and then bring them out from their, from their oppression to the Philistines. And that was the plan, anyway. Uh, only one problem with this plan was Samson himself. Because it seems that Samson wanted to carve out his own course. Despite his parents being godly, who were careful to observe the Nazarite vow that was imposed on Samson's mum when she was pregnant and during her pregnancy. And I just wanted to make this point that a person's giftedness is not a substitute for good character. Though Samson was blessed and endowed with extraordinary power by the Spirit of God, as far as his character was concerned, he was what I would call a, um, a moral midget. So, for example, you know, being a dynamic preacher and, and a brilliant anointed worship leader and, and you know, you're up there on stage and people are patting you on the back saying, man, you're so anointed, well done, you know, awesome. That is in no way an accurate gauge for a person's character or spirituality. We don't gauge a person's spirituality or character, you know, by their outward charismatic giftedness. I don't mean charismatic in the sense of the charismatic gifts but just a person who just like comes across as really gifted, like, wow, this guy's awesome. Being gifted does not automatically translate over to your character, making you more self-controlled or selfless or kind or gentle or loving towards people. Being gifted without the right character can create um, selfish and entitled, uh, arrogant and, and, and pride, uh, prideful people. You know what I mean? Um, you know, just as an example, uh, you know, there's a very popular worship leader that, that I love to listen to. And um, he's so gifted. Great voice, great musicality, just a great musician. And uh, only to find out a few years ago that, um, you know, he'd committed adultery. Because I was wondering, so what's, what's happened to this guy, you know? So I thought I'd just, like, see what's happening in his life. And, yeah, it came up that, you know, he'd committed adultery and... He'd left his wife of 20 years and he has since remarried and, you know, because you know, God's good and God's gracious. But the consequences of his behavior, it's kind of like, and this is just my opinion, has kind of diminished in a way his, his impact for Christ. That's just my opinion. But despite Samson's obvious behavioral issues, God's spirit continues to stir Samson. So in my previous two messages, we looked at chapter 13 of Judges. And now I'm just going to jump into chapter 14. And we read the scripture here. Oh, it's already there. Okay, so it says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I've seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now get her for me as wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. 
But his father and mother did not know that it was the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring out against them, or against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart, as he would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. All right, so just a bit of background here. Um, so here we see Samson goes down to a place called Timnah, which lay about six miles from his home, uh, hometown of Zora in the hills. So I wonder if this works. All right, so you've got Zora here, Timnah here. So you can see it's actually quite, oh, sorry. Let's get back here. Yeah, okay, so we've got Zora there, Timna here, and you can see that Samson, this is where he was living in a hill country here. So six, four to six miles from Zora to, to Timna, so that's where he was traveling from. And so, um, so the scripture describes uh, that Samson went down to Timna, which was geographically accurate, and as much as it was downstream from Zora and Beth Shemesh. It's hard to say, Beth Shemesh, on the south side of what is called the Wadi Sorek or the, the Valley of Sorek there. You know, um, you know, some have suggested that the phrase that Samson went down to, to Timnah has like, uh, like, a, I don't know, um, like a metaphorical uh, application here. Um, kind of they, they kind of might say that it speaks to Samson's downward path, you know, a series of downward movements as Samson moved further and further away from the lifestyle that was expected of him as, as a Nazarite. So he's just spiraling downward. So there's this unfolding pattern of his career, which was to be a spiraling downward path, both in a literal and metaphorical sense. That's interesting, but you know, it actually says in the book of Judges that a couple of you know, references say that some people, they just went down. It's just, what it's really talking about, it's, it's just a, like a, a geographical reference. So there's nothing really kind of metaphorical that you can kind of read into it. Um, even though Samson's life is going downward, you know, towards the comfortable level of compromise, which becomes all the more apparent when we get to uh, chapter 16. So Timna was technically and the territory assigned to the Israelite tribe of Dan uh, by Joshua, when Joshua was kind of like carving up the land for the, for the children of Israel. So Timnah was actually a territory that was assigned to the tribe of Dan, which is the tribe that Samson was a, uh, a part of. But at that time, that area was an area that was not only controlled by the Philistines, but it was populated by the Philistines. So basically, Timna had become like a, 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 a Philistine stronghold. You know, um, Samson, according to the book of Hebrews, was a man of faith. But he was not a faithful man. And this is quite obvious here in chapter 14. So we read that he traveled four to six miles into the camp of a pagan, not to make war, not to stir up trouble, but it seems to fraternize. And eventually he spots a beautiful woman that he instantly becomes infatuated with and decides he has to have her as his wife. Clearly Samson was not living by faith, but by sight. It seems that Samson was on a diverging path, a path that was traveling in a complete opposite direction to the path that God had called him to walk in. You know, um, I kind of see that Samson wanted to live in a way that was far removed from the pressures of his calling. I mean, I, I get that. <laughs> you know, understand that when you've been told literally all your life that you're the man and you're so gifted and your birth was announced not by any angel but by the angel of the Lord himself and that you're the hope of millions of people and you're the deliverer of Israel. I mean, sometimes the ministry of, um, you know, the pressures of ministry can be like 
brutal. There's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just look at some of the Hollywood celebrities that are super gifted and talented and attractive and rich beyond imagination, loved by millions. It's so many of them go off the deep end, you know? Um, getting into substance abuse and, and just strange and bizarre behaviours because their gifts have pushed them out into the limelight a little longer than they wanted to. And their lives are controlled by their managers, who are sometimes their parents. That's trouble right there. Um, and they just feel like there's no freedom for them. You know, I remember uh, Dr. James Dobson, and I've never forgot this, he said, we, we crave that which we cannot attain, but disrespect that, and disrespect that which we can't escape. So we crave what we cannot attain, and we disrespect what we can't escape. And he said this in the context of, of uh, courtship and marriage, but I kind of think it, it applies here when we look at Samson's life. So what happens is when people feel trapped, so what happens when people feel trapped? They crave freedom if they feel they can't escape the life that they thought they always wanted. It turned out to be a prison for them. So what do they do? They disrespect what they can't escape. In other words, they rebel. They do that which is not expected of them. You know, they'll refuse to play nice, they'll act up and they'll do stupid, idiotic things. And hence, we get the Miley Cyruses and the Britney Spears of the world. It's just strange. Strange and bizarre. And I can see how that is what was possibly happening in Samson's heart and mind. So Samson sees this unnamed Philistine woman, falls in love and immediately goes to his folks. So we'll continue on. So he went up and told his father and mother, said, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as wife. Now half the problem was the fact that he was driven and motivated by what he saw. In verse 1 it says he saw. And in verse 2 it says here that I've seen. He was operating on appearance and for personal interest, not for principle or even the greater good. He saw the woman. He liked her. He wanted her. He saw it. He liked it. He wanted it. That was kind of like the philosophy he was living by. And I remember me and some of my friends, you know, back in the day would quote this one. Job, chapter 31, verse 1, which says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? And, you know, uh, every time we'd see a pretty girl walk by, we'd kind of like stop and mutter, you know, this verse under our breath, you know. It's actually pretty funny when I think about it now, but sometimes I think we made the wrong covenant. I think sometimes it was, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then shouldn't I look at a young woman? It seemed to be the way it went when we were young people. Um, but I'd prefer to say this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'd prefer to look to the Savior rather than focusing on trying to police my behavior. I know that when I turn my eyes upon Jesus, as the song goes, the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So, Samson sees this woman and then he demands that his folks get her for him as a wife. And then we continue to read on here. It says, And then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Get her for me, for she pleases me well. You know, his folks were obviously, um, you know, it wasn't the best scenario. You know what I mean? Uh, his folks were obviously pained and they were disappointed. 
You know, come on, surely there's a woman from our tribe or in all of Israel that would suit you better, Samson. But why do you go to the uncircumcised Philistines? You know, circumcision being a sign of the covenant according to the law of Moses. You know, why would Samson want to join himself with pagan pagans outside of the covenant community? You know, the Philistines didn't practice circumcision. So culturally, they were at the bottom rung. So when it came to marriage and through the sexual union, this would bring an Israelite into direct physical contact with uncircumcised heathen. And that was a shocking thought to to the Israelite mind. But here I also think that Samson's folk folks might be using this as a um, this this term uncircumcised Philistine as a as a term of disdain and contempt for the Philistines. And I remember King David when he went out to face the the, the giant Goliath. He says that it says that David spake to the men who stood by him, saying, "What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this?" uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of Israel. So who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God? You know, King David was defiant in his words toward the giant. I mean, he was saying, who does, who does he think he is to defy the armies of the living God? This low life. And I think the same uh, contempt is meant by Samson's folks here too. But what I wanted to bring to to your attention is not so much what Samson's folks said, but rather what they didn't say. So they failed to mention the intermarriage with non-Israelites was forbidden by the Lord in Deuteronomy. Chapter 7 here, verses 1 to 5, it says that. Uh, They never mentioned his special Nazarite status within Israel, that he was specifically called, uh, that he was specifically called to by the Lord, and how intermarriage with non Israelites would compromise his mission. And they never mentioned that it was the Lord's agenda for Samson to deliver Israel or begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines, not marry them. They never mentioned that. Because it seems that his parents' biggest issue with Samson's proposition was more of a cultural, ethnic, or racial thing. Racial issue. In any case, Samson didn't care what his parents thought. Uh, He was selfish at this point, (laughs) insensitive and disrespectful toward his parents and the call of God. And he just wanted what he desired. He wanted to gratify his own flesh. You know, it says here that Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Get her for me, for she pleases me well. This phrase literally means, get her for me because she is right in my eyes. Get her for me for she is right in my eyes. And you know, when you read the book of Judges, the common refrain that uh, sums up this period in Israel's dark history is that they did what was right in their own eyes. Samson was a product of this morally relativistic way of thinking back then. And guess what? That way of thinking is, is alive and well <laughs> today. You know, what's the, the question is, what is moral relativism? Moral relativism is the idea that there is no universal or absolute set of moral principles. It's a version of morality that says, to each his own. And those who follow it would say, uh, who am I to judge? You know, you, know, you do you. And, If it makes you feel good, do it. You know, the line between right and wrong is blurred. And and we have, and when I say we, I mean humans, we have determined the standard of what is right and wrong, not God. And we can see that when we look at the news. Uh, Here's just a little little meme. You know, the Proverbs 26, 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And so we've got the little bloke up there. He says, I believe God gave all of humanity morals to live by. And then his mate says, I believe morality is relative. And no one should force their standards on someone else. Whack. By the way, you smell like garbage and your mum is ugly. 
I cannot believe you hit me with a trout and insulted my mother. You can't do that. Slap, pow. Quit forcing your moral standard on me. Proverbs 26. I'll say it again. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. You know, we would be correct to say that in our culture today that the people, that the people are doing what is right in their own eyes without regard for the one in whose image they bear and the law that he has imposed on the human heart from the beginning. You know, I love it when Paul says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of, men's, uh, of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That is such an interesting passage. So the law of God has been written in our hearts and there are no excuses. And there will be no excuses when, we, when the world stands before God on judgment day because their own conscience will be Accusing them or excusing them. So people can try to live their lives in denial and suppress the truth and unrighteousness, but because of their own conscience, they know what is right and wrong. Innately, that is, this knowledge of right and wrong is hardwired in us by God. It's only when sinners come to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel that we can know that true freedom is not found in pleasure-seeking or merely going along and just doing what takes your fancy at the moment, living like animals, basically. Because we know that sin, when it is taken to its final conclusion, leads to death. The wages of sin is death. But there is hope. Paul said, For everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard. God is the standard. Not us. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. And I underline that. Makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. You see, it's not about what is right in our sight. But what makes us right in his sight. Amen. So let's come... So we come to Judges chapter 14, verse 4. Okay, so Samson's folks were clearly not pleased with Samson's choice to take for himself a Philistine wife. But their plea fell on deaf ears and for good reason. And why do I say good reason? <clears throat> because I believe that verse 4 is key, not only to this whole episode, but it's key to the account of Samson in the book of Judges and why his story is so relevant for us today. It says, but his father and mother did not know that it was the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Samson's parents were totally uh, ignorant of what the Lord was doing behind the scenes. God was the God behind the man. You know, it says here that it was the Lord himself who was seeking an occasion, an opportunity to move against the Philistines. And I don't even think that even Samson knew that the Lord was going to use him to stir the pot. Perhaps God used Samson's selfishness to move towards his desired end. And Samson's marriage to the Philistine woman was going to illustrate that there can be no peaceful coexistence between Israel and the Philistines. And as I mentioned in my previous messages on uh, Samson, that the Israelites had no fight in them. They were content merely existing with the Philistines to accommodate the enemy. But that was not God's plan. That was not God's will. God was going to throw a big spanner in the works. He was going to shatter the status quo. This comfortable compromise was going to be turned on its head. And uh, God was going to use Samson to do it. So Samson was God's chosen tool to rile up the Philistines. Uh, if Israel didn't have the heart to take action against the Philistine, 
then God was going to make the Philistines take action against them. And this woman that Samson saw, the Lord uh, would take that opportunity or occasion to use that situation, that circumstance, to bring Samson back to his preordained plan, I guess you could say. Because remember, it's the Lord that is seeking an opportunity to move against the Philistines. It's the Lord himself. So God is using these on-the-surface, superficial escapades of Samson that readers have been fascinated by for thousands of years when they read the book of Judges. But we've got to understand that on a deeper level, we must see the hand of God in all of these exploits. They're not just fantastical, amazing, like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Look at what Samson's doing. There's a purpose, a deeper purpose behind it. And this is how amazing our God is, that with brilliant irony, we see Samson, a man, a free spirit, a rebel driven by self-interests, doing whatever he pleases without any respect for his parents and with no respect for the claims of God, it seems, Um, But in the process, he ends up doing the will of God. Again, I'd say Samson is named in Hebrews as a man of faith. He is listed for good reason. Because despite his selfish antics, his immaturity, Samson did not doubt where the source of his strength came from. He knew that the Lord had set him apart to begin to deliver Israel from the hands of of the Philistines, God had promised him power and he trusted God for that power and he never doubted that. He knew the source of his strength. It wasn't like it was coming from himself. He knew that wasn't the case. Left to his own, he was a very weak man. Which brings us to Judges 14. Five to six. So we read. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother, and he came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring out against him, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore that lion apart as one would have torn apart a goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Wow, man, this is one of those accounts. You know, of Samson's, you know, feats of power that, that as a, you know, that as, a, that as a kid I'd love to read. I used to love reading that kind of stuff. You know, when we see Samson, you know, dealing with that lion and ripping it apart with his bare hands. And so we see this, you know. But anyway, Samson, uh, Samson's, you know, was heading t- to Timnah, to this Philistine town uh, with his parents. Uh, obviously, he had succeeded in um, convincing them to arrange the wedding because that's where they were going, you know, with this Philistine woman. And uh, but somewhere along the line, uh, along the way, he was separated. He, they got separated. Maybe his parents went ahead, kept on going, or or maybe he had to relieve himself. I don't know. But what actually happened was that he came to the vineyards of Timnah, so he was alone. When all of a sudden he comes face to face with this young lion. You know, he was surprised by it, you know. This line just comes out of nowhere. And this wasn't some old line. This was a young mountain lion that jumps out, roaring against him. I mean, you know, any normal person would be freaking out. But the scripture says that uh, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him or powerfully upon him. And he ripped that lion apart with his bare hands like it was nothing. It says here, like a young goat. So this demonstration of the Spirit's power speaks of unusual physical power. The Spirit of God infuses Samson with superhuman strength. That's amazing. That is mind-blowing when you read about it. But after this whole thing happened, it says that he didn't tell his parents. Um, You know, Samson kind of strikes me as the kind of guy, if that kind of thing kind of happened... You know, in the natural, um, 
he seems like the top, top guy that would be happy to retell that story. You know, like, uh, yeah, you know, I destroyed this lion with my bare hands. But here it says that he, it just, he just remained silent. He didn't tell his parents. And perhaps that was another work of God. Because sometimes shutting up is the most godly thing we can do. But I ask this question. Was the lion attack just some random event? Or was God behind this also? Was this a setup that will see God's purpose for Samson and for Israel fulfilled? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the uh, next part that I've titled Samson uh, Part 4, The Stirrer. So the plot definitely thickens. Um, but as I close, I want to say this, that, um, that God is in control. He is guiding the narrative of Samson's life. You know, God continues to use Samson to, despite his obvious character flaws. You know, even though Samson is not a faithful man, um, he was a man who trusted that the Lord had called him and that he was the source of his strength, despite his obvious character flaws. You know, I read some of these Bible commentaries and there's like, it's like there's nothing nice to say about Samson, you know what I mean? It's just like they just, man, they just rip him, rip him apart. And uh, like there's nothing redeeming about him, but one thing about Samson is he never doubted that it was God's power and God's strength that was upon his life. And he never doubted that. And that's called faith. That's why he is called a man of faith. That's why he's in chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews as a man of faith. See, although we might be faithless at times, God is always faithful. God is a faithful God. And in times of doubt, God gives us grace upon grace. His grace is all sufficient. And if anything, the life of Samson is the perfect example of God's grace. You know, Nat reminded me, uh, and I'll finish on this, that Nat reminded me, and I would, uh, I would say this, um, that in my youth, I absolutely uh, hated school, hated everything about it. And uh, because I hated it, I would wag school, sometimes for like weeks on end, you know. And mum and dad wouldn't know about it until the principal would call and say, ah, did you know that your son hasn't been to school for a few weeks? Or something like that. And they'd go, no, had no idea. And... Um, I kind of joke around and say, well, I was a professional truant, you know, I was really good at wagging school. I was a little rebel in those days. And like Samson's story, I find it so ironic that though I hated school, yet a part of God's purpose for my life is standing here, teaching, preaching, essentially educating the people of God, because the gifts that God gives us are irrevocable. He doesn't take them back because of our behavior. You know, Samson's life is exemplary that in spite of himself, God's will would still be accomplished through him. God's purposes are never thwarted. God gifted Samson with this superhuman strength and ability, and he was going to use him. Almost like a, like a, a blunt instrument, a big spanner to deal a crushing blow to the Philistines. And we see in the life of Samson that, and, and sometimes we may see this even in our own lives, that even when we are not faithful, God is always faithful because God is always working behind the scenes in our lives. You know, I love that word, you know, about casting your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. And sometimes we, when we do doubt that um, we think God is far from us, but God is faithful to us. And God's hand is always, like Paul Scanlon said, his fingerprints are all over our lives. If we were to go like the CSI and take the powder and forensics and all that kind of thing, and we would see God's hand in our lives just leading us and guiding us despite ourselves. Because that's the wonderful, wonderful grace of God. You know, it's easy to... Um, I remember years ago when we were having a Bible uh, study... 
you know, when, when it comes to um, or the Ten Commandments or keeping the law or something like that, uh, it's easy to keep a rule. You just observe it, do it, and then you think you're good, right? But when God calls us to the gospel, when he saves us by the gospel, it actually takes faith, not a rule, to believe that the finished work of Christ is done in our lives. Because sometimes we don't feel like we're saved. Sometimes we don't feel like we're right with God. And so we, like, we want a rule. You know, we want a commandment. But God says that it's faith that pleases me. And when we come to Christ, we understand at times that it's very difficult that when we are going through a rough time or we are sinning, that it would be so easy just to say, okay, Lord, what are the steps that I need to take for me to be right with you? But God says, just believe that the finished work of Christ is complete in your life and that the work that I've accomplished in your life is relevant for you now. You are holy. You are without blame because God is faithful in sending Jesus Christ to cleanse us from all of our sins. That's why we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a faithful God, that you are the God behind the man, that you are the God who is working on our behalf. Lord God, that uh, Jesus is um, forever making intercession for us, Lord, as our high priest in heaven, and that we have the Holy Spirit who is our comforter and our uh, our aid, our helper who comes alongside and undergirds us and lifts us up and encourages us. And, and Lord, we just thank you so much that um, even though Samson, you know, um, there are some who believe that there were no redeemable factors in his life, but obviously there is. He was a man of faith because he understood that you are the source of his strength and that you are the source of his power. And Lord God, we just thank you so much that in the new covenant we have the Spirit of God in us as a seal, as a deposit, as a guarantee for the day of redemption that we are in Christ and that we will receive our inheritance in you, Lord God. And so we thank you for that, Lord God, that you are a faithful God. And we love you so much, Lord. And we thank you for this day. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Thank you.